I'm from the 101st Airborne Infantry, the Screaming Eagle Division. The Army and Navy Screen Magazine have asked me to sit in on a film they're making about Bastogne. I guess I'm supposed to tell you what it was like up there in Belgium during the big German winter offensive, their last offensive of this war. Uh, as small as a Bastogne pocket was, it's impossible for a guy like me to tell you the entire story. And the films we have just aren't enough. You see, the cameramen were so busy at the time, banging away with their carbines and their M1s, that they just couldn't film everything. But anyhow, let's have a look at it. Okay, let it go. We moved into it from a rest area in France, where we were getting re-equipped after a long campaign up in Holland. I think the code orders to Brigadier General Tony McAuliffe, that's him, were something like, get the Screaming Eagles to Merry Christmas. I don't have to tell you how it feels to get tossed out of a nice warm sack. They issued some of the equipment we'd need for a combat jump, but no parachutes. When they didn't give us the canopies, we knew we were tagged for something special. And brother, we were. That very same afternoon, they loaded us into the six by sixes. After the kidding stopped, we began to wonder where we were going. Some of the boys had it, that we were going to be landed in Norway, or be moved back to the States for a jump on Japan. All that night, our pants polished those hard wooden seats. Then, we heard the straight dope, about the breakthrough. How von Rundstedt's December counteroffensive had broken through the Ardennes front for 75 miles from Aachen to the Saar. Heard Merry Christmas on headquarters map was Bastogne, inside the bulge. Bastogne, the road hub. As long as we could hold on to Bastogne, we could screw up the German offensive. That was the angle. First, we moved the Belgians back. No sense them getting hurt. They were a lot like the farmers I knew upstate in Pennsylvania. It was pretty tough to move these people back just before Christmas, after they'd been liberated once. But Christmas around Bastogne didn't look too cheerful for us either. We didn't know who was friend or enemy. Some Germans were wearing our uniforms. So we had to search everyone. Then we really got a jab. It became a white Christmas. Most of us had left our overcoats back in the rest area. We didn't even warm up when the battle started. Lots of fellows got it right away. See that guy, Bobby Leaking, with his M1 and two grenades, he knocked out a machine gun position and a jerry patrol. And after he caught a pack of slugs in his leg, he took care of a burp gunner. That's the way it was, all around the rim the week before Christmas. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. We lost damn near everything. Our quartermaster unit, our ordnance, tanks, trucks, and more important, a lot of good guys. The casually list in some platoons sound like the roll call. They froze in the snow where they got it. Culbert, Harmon, Heitzman, McGregor, Newton, Parks, Merritt, a lot of good men. But our one division was holding off eight full German divisions. Yet no matter how tough things get, there are always some GIs who can make with the human. A couple of them dreamed up a title for us. The Battered Bastards of the Bastion of Bastogne. We laughed and kept hammering away with what little ammo we had left. Then on Friday, Black Friday, the Germans made one of their biggest mistakes. They sent us an ultimatum. Surrender or be annihilated by artillery. Two hours to answer. General McAuliffe answered with one four-letter word. He wrote to the German commander, nuts. One of the boys had to explain the meaning to the crowd commandant. He stated it was just G.I. American or go to hell. The crowds answered our four-letter word with one of their own. Fire. They poured it on. 88s and screaming memes. So we hung on to Bastogne, sweating out an ammo shortage, knowing our only break could be an airborne resupply mission. But the overcast was so thick, a troop carrier plane couldn't get through with a snowplow. Let me tell you, we really sweated. With no weather break expected until New Year's Eve, more than a week away. Hell, by that time, we'd be throwing snowballs at Cherry.
All we could do was hold on and pray. And we prayed. We prayed for a sunrise. We prayed for the skies to open. And on Saturday morning, the day before Christmas Eve, the sun came up, the most terrific sunrise of the war. And in the sunlight were the C-47 sky trains, sky full of Douglas Dakotas and Waco gliders as far as you could see. Tug to Herman, no motor. Goodbye, Herman. Okay, Flash. So long. Look at them, the guys of the 9th Troop Carrier Command, barreling right through the flak and ground fire. Coming in so low over the German lines, we started joking about giving them combat infantry badges to wear over their wings. Jerry is pushing up plenty of flak, and there are plenty of flamers, yet those hot rocks keep coming in, without armor or fighter cover. From the bellies of the steel geese pour the ammo, the rations, the guns, the shells, and all the other stuff we need for our fight. gliders, more supplies, and medics, surgical teams. Those glider pilots, brother, they're the guts and glory boys. After bringing in their glue and fabric crates, they jumped out, grabbed guns, and got in the line with the rest of us for the 1,500 tons of stuff the 9th Troop Carry Command brought us in time for Christmas. So Christmas Eve, we tossed a party. We let the crowds come in close, let them think their tanks had cleared the way. Then we opened up. It was really a surprise party. You can hear them hollering, comrade, begging for mercy, asking for a break. Oh, sure. We gave them a break, the kind they'd been giving everybody else. We broke them all the way down. And when we nailed them wearing civilian and GI clothes, we took good care of them, too. The German supermen. They didn't know what the hell had happened. They thought they had us hold in, but the hole turned inside out. Their great counteroffensive wound up inside our prisoner of war cages. That was the way the Battle of Bastogne ended in the last German offensive of the war. After the 4th Armored rolled in, we began to attack. A month later, the mission was completed, and we screaming eagles marched out. As you know, we got a presidential citation for the deal, the first one awarded to a full division. The citation. These units distinguished themselves in combat against powerful and aggressive enemy forces composed of elements of eight German divisions during the period of 18th December to 27th December 1944 by extraordinary heroism and gallantry in defense of the key communication center of Bastogne, Belgium. When General Eisenhower pinned a picture frame on us, I was thinking about the other guys who came to Bastogne. And I'm sure that most of the other troopers in the 101st we're thinking the same thing. Now, this isn't official through channels, but I've asked the Army-Navy Screen Magazine to show you their pictures. Here are the guys who saved our torn and tattered airborne backs, the hot rocks of the 9th Troop Carrier Command. That's Major General Paul L. Williams. He's the commanding general. The outfit has carried every airborne show in the ETO. Pilots, co-pilots, and navigators, like Colonel Joe Crouch, Scott, Montgomery, Hines, Berman, Crew chiefs and radio operators, Adler, Reynolds, McJunkin, Martin, and the glider pilots. Those are my boys, Simpson, Oliver, and Connors. If you ever run into any of these 9th Troop Carrier guys, buy them a drink for the Screaming Eagle. They really paid for it at Bastogne in the battle in which we all fought. It was plenty rugged.
time we're going to begin with a letter from 43 Foxhole Buddies, somewhere in New Guinea. That's right, 43. Count them. You can show them some scenes of the University of Kentucky where they trained, and a few shots of Lexington, Kentucky. Most of them feel it's sort of a second home town. Well, 43 names is a lot of names. So here's your request, fellas. Here's the main street of Lexington with a glimpse of the Phoenix Hotel where the Army still quarters GIs in training at Kentucky U. And here's the old Keith Chop House. After hours or while on pass, the enlisted men continue to drop in for a glass of beer and to pass the time with the girls who serve the light and mellow brew. U-43 men especially wanted a picture of Joyland, so naturally we include it. But right now, business is a little slow. The roller coaster only takes the curves on Sundays. And it's going to be like that until we get to Tokyo. How's this for a shot of the campus at Kentucky U? Looks pretty much the same, doesn't it? A different bunch of GIs, of course, but they too go for this bluegrass terrain and the famous Kentucky Bells in a big way. be long now before most of these fellows will be shipped to ETO or the South Pacific as engineer personnel. That's why sooner or later they get around to visiting that statue of Prexy Patterson. Like you fellows on New Guinea who wanted to see these pictures, they found Kentucky U a fine place and they'd like a snapshot in their wallets to sort of remind them of what it was like. We've received a barrel of requests from the Pacific Theater for a certain well-known party stationed in Seattle. And we think she should introduce herself. Here's Jill and the G.I. Jive. Hi, you fellas. This is G.I. Jill with G.I. Jive. Sort of a special edition today, fellas, in answer to your request. Just time for two things. A favorite tune and a quick reminder to send me a picture of you. That's right. A picture of you from my pinup boy collection. Don't forget, huh? Now here's that tune I was talking about. Hallelujah. <laughs> That just about winds up this miniature edition of G.I. Jive. Thanks a million for requesting a look at me. Till tomorrow when I'll be G.I. Jive in your way. This is Jill saying good morning to some of you. Good afternoon to some more of you. And to the rest of you, good night. Half a dozen G.I.s from New York have written in asking for a glimpse of Easter Day, 1945 in the big town. As in past years, Easter meant going to church for most New Yorkers. Outside St. Patrick's Cathedral, folks lined the sidewalks, then passed slowly into the dimly lighted church to pray for their loved ones fighting the enemy at Okinawa, at the gates of Berlin, or in the high, thin air over China. For them, as for those attending St. John's Cathedral further uptown, including this large group of waves, there was a husband or a brother or a sweetheart who they wanted safe and well. It was a happier Easter than last year. There were losses in many families, but there was also the bright prospect of victory and peace, much closer than it had ever been before. And because of this, Americans of all faiths in all walks of life gathered in every section of New York to give thanks. And after church was over, to take part in the parades that started in the warm sunlight. The largest crowds, as every year, gathered along Fifth Avenue where cathedral bells pealed and all traffic was halted. 
If anything, the hats were a little screwier this year, resembling everything from flower pots to bird cages. Home for rehabilitation, a wounded soldier was seen occasionally. And that's Henry Kaiser and his wife. Jammed, too, was famed Radio City with its lavish display of Easter flowers, its wide-eyed kids drinking in the excitement, and its regular quota of beautiful New York girls. P5, Lloyd Farrar, stationed somewhere in China, would like to hear an old-fashioned song for a change. None of this jive stuff. He writes, how about something like Down by the Old Mill Stream? All right, P5 Farrar, we'll try to oblige with some very top talent from Hollywood. Uh, ready, men. One, two, three. Here's the lineup from left to right. Jimmy Durante, Alan Jenkins, Sterling Holloway, Hugh Herbert, William Gargan, Ed Brophy, Andy Devine, Alan Hale, Robert Benchley, and Arthur Treacher. stream. Are you wetter than you seem? <laughs> Where I first met you. Ride a cock horse to Danbury Cross. <clears throat> was, <laughs> was that trip necessary? <laughs> With your eyes so Jack was nimble, Jack was quick. Jack jumped over a candlestick. One A. <laughs> if I didn't care, honey child, I wouldn't notice how you were dressed, honey child. It was Now, what did you accomplish by that? <laughs> Love your Sounds a lot older than that. <laughs> My village queen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and Jack Queen. <laughs> it is for this time. Keep the letters coming. Don't forget, by request, Army Navy Screen Magazine, New York City.